And welcome to our Newark History Society program on high school sports in Newark, uh, 1930 to 1965. It's going to be a special evening. I'm Tim Christ, president of the uh, Newark History Society. A number of you are attending your first program, but uh, let me tell you that a group of us started the Newark History Society about 10 years ago. Actually, we're going to celebrate our 10th anniversary um, in April. We have put on over 40 of these programs, and we've been thrilled with the, uh, the interest that, uh, uh, that people have shown in understanding uh, more about Newark's history way back to its founding in, in 1666 and up through the 20th century. Uh, we do have a special program tonight. A couple thank yous before I um, ask uh, Guy Sterling to get us started. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Bob Morasco, who's not here yet, but I think he will show up, the city clerk, who arranges for uh, Channel 78 to film this, and it does go on the, uh, the local um, community television uh, program, and then it's a way of capturing uh, some of the oral history about our, our town. Um, uh, I also want to uh, thank Steve Tedamonti and ask him to say a word of welcome as well as the executive director of the New Jersey Historical Society, rather older than the Newark History Society, about 160-some years uh, old, and, the, and who is um, hosting us uh, tonight. Steve? Thank you, Tim. Um, again, my name is Steve Tedamonti. I'm the Executive Director of the New Jersey Historical Society. I welcome all of you here tonight. And I'm just curious, how many people in the room played high school sports? Quite a few, huh? Bring, it's going to bring back some memories. Glory days, right? Um, uh, I know it's going to bring back some memories for me. I know it's going to bring back some memories for you. And uh, I want to thank uh, Tim for putting this on, and, and Walt, and the speakers tonight. And um, well, let's get with it. Let's get started. Thank you. Okay. Two more things, though. But, um, one, uh, if you want to be on our mailing list, either by email or, or by US mail, mail, please fill out one of these forms. We're well, happy to let you know about future programs. We are an all-volunteer organization, and we do encourage a $25 annual membership, uh, and we would certainly welcome that. But uh, do give us your information. The slips are, are, are around here. Uh, the other is that our next program is going to be on February 6th, again here, and Ulysses Dietz of the uh, Newark uh, Museum. I've been a curator there for some 30 years is going to talk about the jewelry industry in, in Newark, and because that was uh, one of the larger industries and one of the more prominent industries uh, nationally. So that's going to be on February 6th. The other is, just to mention among the other things that we're doing as a society, is something called the Newark Archives Project. And we have a team of, of people going around to the various archives here at the New Jersey Historical Society, now at the Newark City Archives at the Newark Museum before. We'll be going to the Newark Public Library in the spring. And identifying the various archives with Newark-related material. And we probably have reviewed more than a 1,000 collections so far. And our goal is to get an online finding aid to guide people interested in Newark's history to these collections and identifying the elements that really relate to Newark. And one of the interesting things, actually, is to find how much how many of the collections relate to, um, to sports in Newark, including uh, great debates about whether baseball could be played on Sunday back in the uh, turn of the century. The Presbyterians were against it, the Germans were for it. So there's some interesting stories to, um, to come out as we continue uh, that project. So again, welcome. And Guy, do you want to get us started? Good evening, and thank you, Tim. Tonight's program was proposed to the Newark History Society by Walter Chambers, a member of the group's executive committee and a 1948 graduate of East, Hutt, East Side High School, where he was a track man and has the medals to prove it. <laughs> Let's <No>. see them. <laughs> Just two. Just two. Just two? <laughs> Knowing of my interest in sports, Walter asked if I would help him put the program together, and I was only too happy to oblige. 
What Walter didn't know at the time was that I had an ace up my sleeve, my father, a Newarker who's been a well-known name on the New Jersey schoolboy sports scene for many years. He's here tonight as part of the panel, and we're proud to have him. One of the reasons that Walter felt high school sports in Newark would be a good idea for a program was the fact that the city has had so many great athletes over the years a host of whom have distinguished themselves in the college and professional ranks. We could easily do a program on just the Newark athletes to become pros, but that is not our focus tonight. Instead, we will be looking at high school sports in the period from 1930 to 1965, <clears throat> excuse me, a time frame that both Walter and I felt was right for a number of reasons. One was that in comp this is the period right after the opening of School Stadium, the city's premier athletic venue. I hope some of you who are here were able to check out the displays in the lobby that include a photo of School Stadium from opening day in 1925, courtesy of the North Public Library. And as I'm sure most of you know, a new school stadium at the same site just opened for business this fall. Walter and I were there for a football game a couple of weeks ago and it's quite a spot. We also felt that 1930 to 1965 was a good era to focus on because it included both pre and post World War II Newark as well as the Depression. The era also goes back far enough in time to qualify for consideration from a truly historical perspective. Anything more recent we felt was too much in the modern era. Early on we received a communication seeming to indicate that someone felt we were missing the boat by making our cutoff 1965 and failing to consider the great Weequake basketball team of 1967. The fact is we needed a point to stop somewhere and 1965 seemed as good a spot as any. But just for the record, Weequake basketball coach Les Fine had two other state championship teams, both in the period of our discussion, and we're hoping that his name and those teams will be remembered as our program proceeds. Several other items for the record before we begin. As you might imagine, our discussion will focus primarily on boys sports because girls sports didn't, become, didn't begin coming into their own until the 70s when the law changed. Nonetheless, we're expecting some recollection of the role that girls played on the sports scene in the days before they could actually compete. And we look forward to that. Also, for those of you who are wondering, we did ask Sid Dorfman of the Star-Ledger, as well as Lonnie Wright of Southside, to be part of our program tonight, and unfortunately, neither was able to make it. But we readily acknowledge their contributions and wish both of them better days ahead. Last but not least, it is our sincere desire to have our audience participate in this program as much as possible. While we have four panelists to kick things off, no one is a definitive expert on high school sports in Newark, and the greatest understanding of this subject for all of us will come about only through the shared collections of as many of you who want to speak. Hopefully some of you will even be, will even to be able to tell us what's become of the era's bigger names. We're not here to find fault if someone omits something, or in the grand tradition of sports fans, argue over which teams or players were better than others. <laughs> We're here for a communal experience with hopefully everyone walking out of this room tonight knowing at least a little more than when they came in. So it's in that spirit that we start and I now turn you over to our program's moderator, my good friend and a man I'm still convinced could break 60 seconds for the quarter mile, Walter Chambers. <laughs> Guy, you're a big liar. <laughs> so thank you. And I begin my remarks uh, in, in, again, introducing this program uh, and moderating it uh, by saying thanks. Uh, thanks to all of you for attending. Uh, we certainly hope to deliver a program that is worthy uh, of your presence here. And certainly thanks to Guy uh, for all he did to help make this happen and to serve as our setup man, even though he's a press agent for me. 
Uh, and thanks to uh, another person you saw helping out and running around, and I think he's sitting there in the aisle, uh, Gary Hayes, a graduate of Westside High and a member of the NERC Athletic Hall of Fame. <laughs> Gary was extremely uh, also helpful in supporting and in the planning of this program. And although Guy gave credit to me for the idea of this program, that too is not true. Uh, it really came from my good friend, Sam Converser. Where are you, Sam? And you'll hear more about him later. Some years ago, uh, uh, Sam planted the seed of this, uh, this program. So uh, he gets, uh, really gets the credit. As Guy pointed out to you, the format uh, is, is exactly what he indicated. Uh, no one or all of our panelists can cover this very broad subject of sports over this expansive period. So while we may not be able to say all that needs to be said from up here, we are relying on you to fill in the gaps. We were able to get a uh, very, uh, I think, distinguished panel. Started out as four of us, but unfortunately one uh, 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 is ill tonight and, and, and sends his regrets that he could not be here. Uh, but we, uh, we're going to forge ahead and fill in for him. The one thing about all four of the panelists, now three, is the fact that uh, all of them are Newarkers, born and raised, and all are members of the Newark Athletic Hall of Fame. So let me give you a few uh, bio notes on each one of them. Uh, and they're going to cover the subjects exactly as you saw it on the flyer, decade by decade, 30s, 40s, 50s, and into the 60s. First, uh, and who will cover the 30s, is uh, Bob Sterling. As you already know, he is the father of, of Guy Sterling. Uh, Bob graduated from Westside High School in 1936. And before, and then you start doing all the math. He's not. He's 93 years old. Uh, Bob then, after Westside, graduated from Panzer College. Uh, as many of you older folk will remember, it was a very distinguished uh, school for for phys ed and such subjects, located in East Orange, and then. It became a part of Montclair State. Uh, and while at Panzer, a significant fact about Bob is uh, that he was a member of a basketball team that won 44 straight games. It is still the third best college uh, record out there. After World War II service, uh, he coached at Rutgers and then served as athletic director at Piscataway, Piscataway High School for 30 years, retiring in 1987. He had an overlapping career uh, as a distinguished basketball referee at the high school and college levels on, on the local scene, nationally and internationally. Bob is a member of the Panzer College, Newark Athletic, and the uh, as I mentioned, and the New Jersey NJASIAA Halls of Fame. And as noted, he's related to Guy Sterling. <laughs> Our next speaker covering the 40s is Dr. Paul Keel, born in Newark, Beth Israel Hospital, grew up on Milford Avenue. For you Southsiders, you know that's the street just under uh, Johnson Avenue. Graduated from Miller Street School, and one of the notes uh, says that he took first place in the high jump in 1944. When you meet him, you know that size does not matter. <laughs> uh, I was a high jumper too, but not, not that good. <laughs> he graduated from uh, Southside in 1949. While there, he co-captained the swim team, setting all kinds of records, and lettered in cross country. Both of these activities uh, continued into later adulthood. At age 80, Paul has finished 52 marathons. He's, <laughs> he's, 
he's rated a, a master swimmer. That includes numerous events in the Hudson and Potomac Rivers, as well as Chesapeake Bay. On a personal note, he is a graduate of Washington and Jefferson College and Chicago Medical School, and he is a psychiatrist. He's married to Benita, who is also a swimmer. I saw the tape. Uh, and they have five children. Our next speaker, who will cover the 50s, is Leonard Moore, uh, another Newarker. Graduated from Westside High School in 1954, where he earned many honors, all city, all county, you name it, as a distance runner. And he served as the captain of all of Westside's track teams, cross country, indoor, and outdoor. He continued this outstanding performance and leadership at North Carolina Central University. Lenny is a member of his alma mater's Hall of Fame, and as I mentioned, also the Newark Hall. After military duty, he returned uh, to Newark to become an amazing high school track coach with many uh, state championships and records to show. In 2000, he was inducted to, into the New Jersey Scholast Scholastic Coaches Hall of Fame. Lenny Moore retired uh, as Assistant Director of Physical Education and Athletics for the Newark Board of Ed. He is married to Annie Dalton, and they have three daughters. Now, our fourth speaker uh, was to be uh, Frank Ferducci, and I'm sure many of you certainly know that name. And I'll just mention him uh, uh, because uh, we certainly will miss him, but uh, he and Lenny are very close, and Lenny has agreed to move over uh, from the uh, 50s into the 60s uh, as he talks. But you know Frank for a long time, uh, while a graduate of uh, Barringer in 1952, he too went to Panzer, and, uh, and uh, that name is certainly synonymous with high school sports in Newark. So let us begin now with the 30s, and we'll have Bob Sterling lead us off. Bob. Fine, thank you. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> You're taking me back to the 30s. That's about uh, 70 years ago or so. <laughs> I was born and raised in Newark, <clears throat> living mostly <clears throat> in Littleton and Avenue and South Orange Avenue. And a block away from our home was a place we called the Lots. The Lots was a, <clears throat> an abandoned uh, uh, big home with a lot of property on the side. And the city took it over as a playground. And <clears throat> the gentleman who uh, was the instructor there was Guido Cavallero. You people from uh, South Side would know Guido Cavallero as the basketball coach. And uh, <clears throat> he brought his team there uh, during the summer. They'd come down to see him and so on. But the highlight of that area was the softball games that we played in the evening. And the sidewalk would be lined up with people who would wait there. For instance, South Atrey's uh, playground <clears throat> had a very good softball pitcher. And they came down to play the what we call the lots team. And that whole sidewalk was lined up with people and the Berry family, whom we, we knew well, and one of the Berries played with the, uh, the lot team, <clears throat> was there. So we, that was a highlight of that, that particular program. I was told to speak about baseball. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about baseball in the beginning. I played for two years at Westside High School. And uh, <clears throat> if that, uh, I played for a coach by the name of Bob Riley. And uh, I had uh, been playing with uh, a semi-pro team in Newark called the m and AC. If you want to find out what the word m and means, just spell it backwards. And uh, you'll see that. And we did have, and Newark did have, a, a semi-pro league. And we happened to have won it once, once, at least one time or so. But I'll take you back to my... Uh, early days, and I graduated from 14th Avenue School. And there were four people in that school that year, and I'm talking about teachers, whom I still remember. 
I had a fifth grade teacher by the name of Miss Ruth Zender. She taught English and history. What a wonderful lady she was. And I, I sometimes hear people say that bad teachers are bad and bad. She was one wonderful teacher. I had a gym teacher by the name of Tom Donovan. He organized his, uh, especially the apparatus work, excellently. And I am a physical education major, although you get a, <clears throat> when you graduate from Panzer, you get a bachelor's degree in education. Uh, <clears throat> Tom Donovan did an excellent job. We had no gym, so they used the, uh, the uh, space at the top where they called it their auditorium. The, th the third man was a man called Jerry Rose Amelia. Jerry Rose Amelia ran the recreation program at the 14th Avenue School. They had a playground, and of course, they had the high fences around and so on. And what he did, he organized a uh, softball tournament every year for the grades from going from 6, 7, 8, up to 6, 7, and 8, and we would play the games after school. And as one of the participants, you always look forward to the end of the school day so you could get to play that ball game. And the fourth man was a, a, a police officer from uh, Newark. He ran the uh, safety patrol. We, uh, <clears throat> that was an honor to uh, be a member of that patrol because we would get out of class a, little, a bit earlier. And they would give us a badge we put on our arm and we had corners that we stationed at and made sure that our fellow students didn't cross in a way of maybe getting hit by the car. I graduated from 14th Avenue School, and I thought I would go to Westside High School. I lived six blocks from Westside High School. I wound up having to go to Robert Treat Junior High School, which was 20 or more blocks. And think about that in the wintertime. But I did it, and you, I would uh, stop and pick up one of my friends on, who lived the block below me in Fairmont Avenue, and then we'd have to walk the distance. And I know that because years later, I worked for a while at the Newark uh, Parental School, where we kept uh, young, any youngster 16 or under, the police brought in, they caught him doing anything via. And I worked at that park on Sussex Avenue. <clears throat> I think we called it Boys Park, but I worked there, and then I would leave there and go down and take these people uh, through the rest of the evening till 11 o'clock at night, and then I'd uh, walk on home for myself. I uh, went to uh, Robert Street Junior High School for one year, and then I was able to go to Westside High School for the following three, and that's when I started playing uh, baseball for Bob Riley. One of the th uh, sports that I didn't play and couldn't play was basketball. And the reason we didn't, I couldn't play basketball, we didn't have basketball. And the story that I was told, the principal of the school was Mr. Allen Johnson. He had been the principal at Barringer High School. And while he was a principal there, one of his youngsters, or basketball players, ran into the wall and was severely injured. So when he became principal of Westside High School, we. He, no basketball. However, when he left, a Miss Beatrice Hamilton took over as the principal, and Walter Bacon, who had played at Southside High School and was one of their outstanding players, he played at Southside High School, then he went down and played at George Washington University in D.C., and then he was a recreation instructor at the Westside Playfield under Vinnie Farrell, who was the director. He was uh, selected as the coach, and uh, his star at that time was Richie Regan. I guess most people, if they know anything about basketball, know Richie Regan. Richie uh, uh, <clears throat> finished his days at uh, Westside High School, and then he went on to Seton Hall, and he uh, played there and he coached there. And in my uh, officiating career, I officiated the game he played against uh, West Point with Bobby Knight. And I got to know Bobby Knight very well after that game was over, because he was very pleased with the officiating. Not that I want to do it. <laughs> they did beat Seton Hall, and he said that the cadets were very uh, pleased, and he wanted to come in and thank me. Uh, I noticed he didn't thank my partner, but I said nothing. You know, he, he, the less you speak, the less trouble you get into. I got to be good friends with Knight, by the way. And uh, uh, I ran a basketball camp at Rutgers University under the guise of Rutgers Prep. I was the uh, director of the camp, and so, so
since I knew most of the people, I had been offici I officiated college basketball, I officiated high school basketball, and some of the people that I played against years ago were playing, and I still officiated for them, but that's another story for myself. We did bring basketball back to Westside, and, and Richie Regan and uh, Walter Bacon as the coach did very well. Among his players, uh, I told you, was, was Regan, but the story that was told to me uh, about Regan was they had an athlete at Westside High School called Tom Higgins. His son is now coaching the football team at uh, Piscataway High School. Higgins played uh, football for a coach at Westside by the name of Snavely. Snavely's brother was the head coach of football at the University of North Carolina. So Tom Higgins wound up at North Carolina. I hired Tom Higgins as a football coach at Piscataway High School, and he did a very fine job and turned it around, and he was the best crowd control person I had when we had a basketball home game or my football at a home, well, he, he couldn't coach, uh, work control for football, but he could control the crowd very well. He was big, he was strong, his father was a big uh, uh, police officer at the time. And Higgins was supposed to be the man who was successful or made Richie Regan successful. He was his rebounder. He'd get the ball for him. And that, but with, both of them got along very well. Higgins also was one of the five letter man winners. He, he lettered in football, basketball, track and field, swimming, and baseball. You don't find many five-letter athletes in, in high school these days. If you think about that, that's pretty doggone good. <clears throat> the other uh, story that I want to tell you about uh, Westside High School, I had a very good math teacher there, a man by the name of Frank Martlin. And as, if I am correct, the Newark City High School Hospital was named after Dr. Martlin. Am I correct on that? Well, Frank Martlin taught me ninth grade algebra and tenth grade geometry. A super teacher, really a super teacher. And I'm making a pitch for the teachers because as I listened during the course of my life, some, there's got to be something wrong with teachers. There, there are some teachers that need a little extra help, but by and by far, the teachers that I had in the city of Newark were as fine the teachers I ever had, and I, I have a master's degree for certification for a secondary school principalship out of Rutgers University. And I had had teachers who taught me at Westside High School that could move on to the collegiate level and do a very fine job. Well, I can mention the name of Dr. Milwoski. He taught the uh, languages. He could speak about three or four or five languages himself. And I told you about uh, Frank Marlin. I played two years of baseball under Coach Riley, and we played at, Wales at Valesburg Park. Now, <clears throat> during the summer months, the city of Newark ran what, what we called, when I say we called, the Crime Prevention League. I, it's noted in the uh, notes in the, that I read or somebody that had written as this, a Newark Safety League. Each ward had a major league team in the competition within the city. And I played for the 14th ward, and we were the Cincinnati Reds. We used Westside Park, and our manager and coach was Pop Mertz. And Pop Mertz, at that time, was a one-man coach of the Hilltoppers. The Hilltop Toppers were very good at basketball. They'd go around and play. Uh, some of the uh, other teams, big teams, and they also played uh, softball. But Pop Merch knew his be baseball, and I played with some very good people there. Some of the people who played with me at Westside High School, Ted Bud Budnowski was the third baseman, Jimmy Rollo was a shortstop, uh, my catcher was Carmine Dispensary. Uh, in those days, if you remember, the North Bears were located in the, in the city, and they would honor an outstanding high school baseball player at the end of the year and take him for a trip maybe to Toronto or Rochester for a couple of trips. And one of the people who won that honor was a, a gentleman by the name of Stan Winneck. Stan Winneck played for Irvington High School. He was a catcher. 
and he did a very fine job. But that, that, that's how baseball would go. I had a chance to, to, to play uh, minor league baseball. I was uh, approached by Joe Strip, played third base for the Brooklyn Dodgers. And I found out he lived in Harrison. I didn't know that, but I found that out. He wanted to send me away for $50 a month. And I don't know how many hot dogs or hamburgers you could eat for $50 a month. And you had to pay rent for the, uh, the room that you had to rent. And I chose to rather to go on to college. And I went to Panzer. In my days at Panzer, uh, we won 44 straight games. We lost the game to John Marshall, who was coached by Matty Begovich. Now, that name, if you know basketball, you know Begovich. He was a big time official. And uh, they beat us over at Bayonne High School. Uh, a week later, we played them again at Panzer College, and we, we returned it. We beat them, but the, the, the record was broken. One of the finest players on that team was a man by the name of Swede Mason. Swede played for Weequake High School. You, many people know him. Anybody know him? Remember him? He had springs in his legs. His son wrote a book about him. It's a very interesting reading, by the way, and there's a picture on the cover, the back cover. He's jumping against the center. He's at least 24 inches higher with his arm than the center he's opposing, and he's, he's way over the ring. He had springs in his legs, and he was a fine athlete. He wasn't anybody who would pop off at the gums. He played the game and played it well. Excellent rebounder, excellent ball player. He played for Weak Wake High School. I guess Art Lustig was his coach. <clears throat> I told you about uh, Mr. Johnson leaving the uh, well, West Side and uh, Miss Hamilton taking over. And I told you about Higgins being uh, uh, Richie Regan's rebounder. And Rich Richie, you know, uh, <laughs> At times, I guess uh, he'd be playing basketball tonight, and his, I guess he didn't do much homework. <laughs> but he was very popular. He and Walter Dukes, remember Walter Dukes? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very good basketball player. They, were, they teamed as a, as a group. Because Nork would run a gold medal tournament at Westside High School at the end of the season. And uh, we had the McGuire brothers. I remember I followed them out of the Westside gym one night. They were arguing. Dick and Al were arguing about how much money somebody gave them to come over and play in this gold medal tournament. But uh, ah. they were in it there. We had uh, uh, Dolly King come in and play. I refereed basketball with Dolly King. He had played with the great uh, Long Island team and uh, Claire B, of course. I spent the summer <coughs> while I was at uh, Westside High School working out with the football team. And the uh, captain of the team was Ken Millsop. Uh, you may, some people may remember him. He worked for Benjamin Moore Paint later on. He was the captain of the 35 team that was coming up. I was hoping that I would, could play best, uh, football that, that summer. And when the time came for me to take the paper home to my mother, I didn't have a father. My father, my original father, had passed when I was a baby. And uh, my uh, stepfather, he also had passed. So my mother said, I want to sit down and talk with you, Bob. And uh, just right from the beginning, she says, if you were to get hurt seriously, we don't have any money to pay for you. So I didn't play football at Westside. I just played the baseball. And ironically, uh, Westside High School won the 1935 city championship in football. But that's the uh, say la guerre, I say. I learned that in my French class. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have to take what comes to you. I went on. Uh, I went on to Panzer College. You get. I told you that you get a Bachelor of Science degree in Education, and uh, I <coughs> went into the uh, United States Air Force, and I was assigned to work with the. Um, since I had graduated from Panzer, with the Aviation Cadet Physical Fitness Program, they assigned me. I started out at Maxwell Field, and then they sent me down to Turner Field, the home of Jimmy Carter. One of his uh, sisters was the uh, was a clerk and a uh, and secretary for the physical training people. And I wrote a booklet on Turner's 20 toning techniques. As a result of that booklet, uh, and I had a uh, 
an airman from the communications department printed up for me. We printed 500 copies. We took them down the next day to the uh, colonel of the field, Turner Field. It was a B-25 base. B-25s were made famous by Billy Mitchell when he bombed uh, Japan, I believe. Okay. Uh, flew B-25. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> uh, two days later, I found myself in Miami Beach Officer Candidate School. I finished that as a second lieutenant and it was assigned back to Jackson, Tennessee. I worked with the finest young men in the country of the United States. And one of the things that bothers me personally, we're supposed to be an intelligent group of people, and yet we have to have wars. Think about it. I, some of the young people, we had the best in the aviation cadet program. Some of them didn't make it. I had them coaching some of them. I coached the, I spent the afternoon uh, one of my uh, former players was a Superior Court judge in New Jersey, Larry Weiss. He passed away, so I, we were at his uh, wake this morning at a funeral. But some of those people, I just can't imagine why we have to have wars. But that's the way it goes, and there's nothing you can do about it. You got a minute, Pop. Okay. I want to say something else about the, they gave me a, uh, Barringer High School was noted for fencing. They had the Sertrula family and the Boots of Carrick family. And I did my student teaching at Newark Academy when it was up downtown, but it's now up in Livingston. And they have a, a, a fencing uh, uh, room there in honor of the Sertrula family. And uh, any time I officiated in Pan American Games, whether it was in Canada, or whether it's in Mexico, or wherever. Fencing is a very popular sport. And by the way, the Pan American Games are always played one year before the Olympic Games. And I want to say a couple of things about the, the Newark Recreation Department. Uh, you'll have a guest there, Bumi Malikoff. I see he was talking to some of you people he knew from Southside High School. Some of the recreation people work in our playgrounds have done a lot, a lot of good for a lot of the young men and women. When you work for the Pan American Games, you referee both women's games and men's games. In Chicago, we worked, we used DePaul University for the men's games, and then we used Hillary Clinton's high school, which is outside the city of Chicago, for the women's games. But you do have to work both games as part of that deal. I. Uh, <clears throat> I want to tell you that as I finish what I have to say, the Cetrulos, we, we had one of the Boots of Carries go to Panzer College, so I know something about fencing. Uh, the cream of the crop was Dean Cetrulo, and I don't know whether you know it or not, but he was also an actor, and he was an understudy to Jose Ferreira in the uh, uh, production 90 uh, Cyrano de Bergerac film or so on. He was, a, he was an understudy too. He was a handsome young man. I understand he flew for the 8th uh, eighth, uh, eighth, uh, Bombing uh, uh, Air Force unit in London, and the irony of that is that my brother-in-law was an aide to General Timberlake, who was the commanding officer of that group, so I knew a lot about him. I'm about to uh, <clears throat> tell you that the uh, Dean Cetrullo was an, an, an actor, and he was an all-American fencer, both in foil and saber. And we have some very good photos out there in, in the front <laughs> that I saw about fencing. I'm, I, I personally, uh, I, I like to watch it. I would see it uh, when I'd go to Mexico or Canada or wherever they, Guatemala or wherever they played the games, or I had them. I would see some of it, but uh, uh, I, I never got involved in it myself. I think I uh, have about finished. Am I, am I close? You're close. Okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a nice, that's a nice way of telling me. You're a high guy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, going to talk about the, the Newark Scholastic athlete, but really the, the athlete in spirit. I'm, I'm just waiting for the uh, 
for the title to come on. You can go. Uh, a city needs spirit to survive was <laughs> was an article I was, I was lucky to get into the Times Sunday in April of 1984. The people that took the picture didn't, this picture didn't know that Mayor Koch lived here. This is 61 Milford. This is how it looked in 1964. And the top half of the article describes the state of destruction. And now I'll, I'll illustrate. Now bear with me. I'm going from 1984 to 1941. This is the backyard of our house. My father holding the dog. He doesn't look happy. He, he always accepted that we had dogs. <laughs> this is the back porch. Here is the apartment building across the street. And the houses were very close together as they are now. And this was Mrs. Austin's home. And she had beautiful flowers. People would come for miles to see, see her garden. Well, the top half of the article describes a state of destruction. And I'm, I gave this picture just to show the background. Across the street, facing now 1984, facing what used to be my father's dental office. I didn't mention my father was a dentist. The home it was an office home, three stories. Bought, he bought it in 1940 for $4,000, and was still paying a mortgage <laughs> <laughs> up, up until the time they left in 1958. And in the article I described, now, now facing my father's dental office was this leering, toothless grin. Broken, decayed teeth, the picture of death. This leering grin facing my father's office and one big cavity where his office was. But in another part of the city, as I wrote in the article, there was a, the 20 kilometer race that Mayor Gibson had instituted. This was about the 10th year they had it. And what I was saying that the hope of the city lie in the spirit of the athlete. And that consisted of, I don't want to do a Rick Perry, of oh, the feeling of giving, <laughs> sacrificing, discipline, hard work, and the smooth coordination of parts. And that's what was need, needed for the city to rebuild. And that's what was in the bottom half of the article. So I'm going to talk about Newark High School athletics as I knew it from 1944 to 1949 as a participant in swimming, cross country, and a little bit of track, and maybe a little touch, I can talk a little bit about baseball, basketball, and football. This is a photo, this is, this is now I'm going to cheat a little bit, this is grammar school, but it's the eighth grade. Wilbur Hooper and I, his high jumping, trans, high jumping, we were high jumpers, he didn't look that much bigger than me, but he was in the senior class, and I was considered an intermediate. And here's the high jumping pole uh, where I went to jump over, and his was over on this side. Well, uh, his his ability to jump translated into he became he was a terrific basketball player and a terrific uh, football player. And my ability to jump off was confined to just that, that, parallel, <laughs> that parallel bar. Wilbur kind of took it on himself to um, teach me a little bit about basketball. Now, this was our team. They were terrific. This was our grammar school team. And I wasn't on the team, but I wanted, I wanted to learn how to play. I wanted to be with them. And if this looks like I'm in my underwear, it is. <laughs> I made myself the manager of the team. This was taken after a game. And 
we have won 66 to 3. And if not for me, it would have been 64 to 3. I'll tell you about that. It is the last part of the game. Mr. Snavely, who you just mentioned, Francis B. Snavely, whose, whose brother was a coach at Cornell and then at North Carolina, and then became the principal at Westside. He was a referee. He was a very good athlete. It was surprising. He, he was a very good athlete. They put me into the game. How did I get into the game? One of the guys throws off his shirt. I, take, I put it on. I was so happy to have on that swelly, not so fragrant <laughs> shirt. But I was in the game. And Mr. Snavely said, Paul, stay right here. I was at the end of their basket. You know, like, stay away from the rough stuff. They were fighting for the ball at the other end. All of a sudden, Wilbur captures the ball, passes it the length of the court. I did a, a layup and made it the score 66. <laughs> Let history know it. And remember that, because I'm going to come back to that, that later. It was on then to high school. Oh, I should, wait, wait, before you, go back a second, please. I, I didn't mention Bobby Malthus, yeah. who later played Major League Baseball. And there's John Walker, who you know, many of you know about his, his reputation as, as a teacher. And he was a terrific basketball player in both high school, in, well, here and in high school, and a terrific uh, football player. I think he would, would be the equivalent now of the wide receiver. So it's on the high school now. And um, here, here the, Bobby was senior of the month, and they mentioned uh, his, he was a good basketball player, but in baseball he w went on to play in the majors. Five, he had five seasons in the majors, and today he's a scout for one of the teams. The other one, John Walker, mentions that he wants to go to college and get a degree in physical education. He did go to college, and the story was, although he had a scholarship, he absolutely had no money in his pocket, and he had to leave after a short time. Went into the service, had some pocket money, came back, got a scholarship to Howard, and you all know his academic uh, he became assistant, super, assist, assistant superintendent of the Nutley school system. He was beloved. A, I think it's a stadium was named after him after, after he died. Pardon me while I get my script. You dropped, you dropped. I dropped the ball. Dropped the ball. That's a <laughs> you can click it now. I tried my hand in basketball in high school. Uh, I could shoot very well if nobody's bothering me. And I got, <laughs> I got, I was, made the first cut, and then when they saw me play, I was the first one cut. <laughs> and I settled for swimming, because that, who knew about it? All the Southside had, in 1945 were the champions, and in 1946 were the champions. But this is the sport for the more serious-minded, maybe even the scholar-athlete. This is Milton Klein. No, go back, please. This is Milton Klein. Today, he's a leading architect. He's internationally known. I became a psychiatrist. To my left is Bernie Kramer, who was a pediatrician. We were the co-captains of the team. There's Eddie Schwartz, who became a math teacher. He help me with my math and in college I wouldn't have passed I took a course in physics over the summer and I, I, I wouldn't have passed if he didn't help me. Artie Blydenberg became a police captain this is Eddie's brother uh, Alan who's an accountant I don't know but this is Fred Furman I know he died a few years ago this other guy was went to graduated that year went to Newark Rutgers for two years, took off a year, then went to pharmacy school. He was a thinker. He was a guy in the back of the bus who would talk and laugh and we'd look up to him and he would tell us about life. And he understood business. And after he became a pharmacist, he had his hand in a few things. He was CEO of a few organizations. He was the head of the beauty and health aids. 
at Foreign Auto. That was two guys from Harrison. That went under. He worked with a couple other countries and then uh, companies. And then we were friendly. I knew him. We were friendly socially into the 50s and 60s. And then he kind of disappeared. And the next I heard from him, heard about him, he and a guy named Blank formed a company, maybe you've heard of it, Home Depot. <laughs> that's, that's Bernie Marcus. He grew up a poor kid and worked after school, worked in a drugstore. And, uh, but he, 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 he had something. In swimming, where Higgins, and you heard about Tom Higgins, excelled in football, and he went on to play three years of professional football. And here's an article about him. And juxta, juxta, what's juxtaposition is the write-up of the West Side. Uh, they won the championship that year, that year, 47. Now, I'm reluct I was reluctant to this kind of thing. I'm going to talk about myself here. But um, it's my computer and it's my slide, so. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Uh, Higgins, in the dual meets, had had beaten me. And in my mind, now here's this big guy. He had tremendous stamina. He wasn't the swimmer that looked nice swimming, but. He, he, he was a powerhouse. And, and in my mind, I made this was a David and Goliath. And I was a good guy, and he was a bad guy. And, <laughs> and I wanted to win. And I had a plan. And I did. It, it says I came from behind. It, 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 that's dramatic. <laughs> I, I had a game plan where if I got ahead of him, he'd get panicky. And uh, I was. It was in my mind, it was, it was a monomania with me. And the point is, it was, it was a real lesson in life that if you really prepare and really want to do something, you can. If you're prepared, you'll be successful, usually. And wherever I was successful, it was because I was prepared. And that was a, it was a great lesson and motivated. And when I wasn't that prepared, I wouldn't be that that's successful in things. I also went out for cross country. Well, uh, when I'm getting ahead of myself, um, our coach was Otto Stahl. Uh, he um, he coached football after the woods, but that year, '47, we lost all our meets. <laughs> And the next year, he coached football. And you can click the next one. Uh, I, I want to mention something about Coach Stahl. He died in 1998. I saw him a number of times over the years. And the one thing I remembered about him was this. In the 1948 season, Southside lost every game, scored only six one touchdown, six points, and didn't even make the extra point. But there was one incident where he, well, there was some disagreement, and some of his players <coughs> wanted to go and rumble with the other team. It was almost a fight, and he threw his own players off. He threw them out of the game. That didn't go. And I wrote about this in the letter to the uh, ledger when he died in, in the end of December of 1998. I, he also coached track. And now we have the emergence of, a, of an athlete you'll hear a little more about. That year, now this should be May 1948, the city meet. And that year they did something unique. They had, they had class relays. You, just, you didn't have to be on the track team. You just volunteer for it. And a new athlete that we'd hear more about later, Fred Means, was on the winning freshman team.
Another victory was, well, uh, I, I think I gotta, I'm getting ahead of myself again. Well, that fall I, did, I went out for cross country. That was my last semester. And in our last meet, seven of us tied for first. Now, remember that one too, because that's gonna come up later. I had a half season of swimming left. There was also the, what were they called, the Eastern Interscholastic Cross Country Meet that was held at Seton Hall. This is Ira Eggleston, Tommy Williams, they were our co-captains. And our coach Anderson somehow finagled the idea, there were schools from all over, all over the East Coast, but he finagled the idea Let's have a tro let, let there be a trophy for the first Newark team. And lo and behold, Southside won that trophy, but we were the only Newark team, <laughs> Newark High School team in it. But that's, I'm, I'm, I'm revealing the secret now. So I had a half season of swimming left. And now a new, new phenomenon. It was, like a lot of things that were gen almost gentlemen's agreement and understood, uh, blacks, or, or was it called the, the, the colored people, weren't sort of allowed in some of the bigger theaters. And, and perhaps, and maybe not even the YMCA pool here. And in pools. And lo and behold, we have a new uh, swimmer uh, Freddie Means, and I think oh, I hope he's not embarrassed when they tell him to leave. <laughs> really, but but Freddie, uh, and he was Freddie, and he was a little guy. <laughs> he came on, and he swam the same event with me. The next year there was no swimming, but the, in 1951, his senior year, go go back. Uh, he came in second in the backstroke. There's first, second, and third place. Freddie took a second, Southside won the city meet. They have first, second, and third. There are about a dozen in there. It wasn't only three people. I think we can go to the next clipping. I didn't, Wilbur Hooper, I want to go back to him, transferred to Central because they had a better uh, uh, basketball team and it was, it was more promising for his athletic career. I saw him in 1967. We all had decided, some of us had all, all of a sudden decided, let's have a reunion of the Miller Street and get our old teacher, Mrs. Ada M. Hoagland. And we had the reunion at my house and she was there and Wilbur was there. And I only learned then that his mother now, this is 1967, who had just turned 60, had just gotten her college degree. She had worked as a domestic. She came up, when they came up from South Carolina, she had only two years of college. So she worked and got her college degree and embarked on a career as a school teacher. This is the 1994 reunion. I had seen Tommy before, but Wilbur was also at this reunion. And the sad irony, here, here he is, the co-captain of our cross-country team in a wheelchair. He had been in a wheelchair for about 20 years. He had multiple sclerosis, but his spirit was still with him. He was a very feisty guy. He had been a policeman in Newark. He had been in the, in the military. And he wouldn't think anything was wrong, except if, unless you saw the wheelchair. Tommy died in 02, and the funeral was uh, here in Newark. I wrote something after that. I don't remember where, where, where I had it published, but I wrote that just as sometimes when I dream of being back in my long ago house of my boyhood, you can, you can leave it on. Yeah. So, so too will Tommy be bounding up and down the hills in Westside Park. And the seven of us will hold hands, crossing the line together. And I'll be back in the instant Wilbur passed the ball to me in the gymnasium. 
what was revealed that day, two things. I said, Wilbur, do you remember that uh, basket I made? He says, do I remember it? He says, the only thing I don't remember is whether you had two left feet or two right feet. <laughs> he said, they, they planned it. That was the spirit of cooperation and giving. And Tommy's recollection was the time the seven of us tied for first place, first place when we all did it together. But it was always back to Miller Street. My friend Alan Berlin, who became principal at Livingston High and retired in 1986 and is now, maybe some of you know him, he played on our 48 winless Southside football team, but he led us in football, made this t-shirt for me. I was running the Honolulu Marathon, and the t-shirt said Miller Street. So let me end with Miller Street. It goes like this. This is, in 19, that reunion was 94. I tried to get in touch with Wilbur, but he was busy packing. They were moving to Atlanta. A year later, and it was in summer of 95, I learned Wilbur had suddenly died. By the way, all Mrs. Hooper's sons, five sons, predeceased her. I uh, called the home, and I wanted to make a call. And I came there, and I'd been at the house once before, and it was like time to stood still. They, the same home on Pennsylvania Avenue, and I never met Mrs. Hooper. And after we got talking, she said to me, "Were you were you one of my boys?" I left something very important out. When we graduated grammar school, okay. how could I have left this out? No. I have to go back. I have to you go back. To go back. All right, I'll go back. <laughs> I won the prize, the PTA prize for scholarship. Wilbur won the PTA prize for citizenship. PTA, Parent Teachers Association. She said to me, so, all right, now 1995, were you one of my boys? I said, what do you, what do you mean? I, I didn't know what you meant. She said, I was the president of the PTA. <laughs> and I remembered, I didn't say anything, my mother was the vice president. <laughs> 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 could it be the fix was in? <laughs> It was the biggest fix since the days of Shoeless Joe Jackson. <laughs> but it, it's my point of the athletic spirit, how a black Christian mother allied with a white Jewish mother to see it, that, that, her, that her princely sons <laughs> receive their just rewards. And that was the spirit then that I mentioned, giving, sacrificing. <laughs> and the other, the other attributes I mentioned, and that's the spirit that will finish the rebuilding of, city, of the city of Newark and return it to its rightful place as one of the leading cities in the country. Uh, there's a little difference in age, but after you get over 50, it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, I'm very delighted, folks, to be here tonight. Uh, when uh, Walter called me and said, would you join this uh, committee, I said, I'd, I'd, love to, I'd love to. Because no matter where I go, no matter what I do, I'm a proud Newark. Yes. Right. And during those times, you know, Newark had the best school system in the United States. Had one of the greatest recreation programs in the United States. Full-time recreation. Had it not been for the playgrounds, many of us would not be here today. So when I talk about athletics, uh, I, I, I saw Tommy on there. Uh, but I remember a fellow from West Side named Walter Hockaday. Oh, yeah. And, uh, he went to West Side. Yeah. He was first in the city. He tied with another guy first in the city. was a guy named Smith mm -hmm. that year that I ran. And he went on to win the county, I think, and they won the state championship. Sure. Yeah. And uh, to get a little background on me, uh, growing up in Newark as a little kid, uh, I was real small, feisty, mean, 
<laughs> had to because I was little. Had to go past the place twice to cast a shadow. <laughs> Tied both knees together to, to make a make a kneecap. <laughs> I wanted to play football, but like Keel said, Dr. Keel said, uh, I was too small. And I was introduced to track and field. I, well, I ran, but I didn't know anything. About what, what the heck was cross country? I said, cross country? What is cross country? So that's how I met Walter Hockett, because I, I walked to Westside Park. And the, t the day that I went there, they were having the county meeting. And he won that. The first football game I ever saw was in 1943. I saw a fellow named Jim Bowie mm -hmm. playing for Westside. And if history reminds me, I think he, every touchdown he scored was over 65 yards. Mm -hmm. And one time he turned around and told the guys to come and catch it. <laughs> 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 but I don't have any notes, and I'm not a great orator, but if I can recollect a little bit that Newark had a great track meet that they called the Newark track meet where everybody from the state came. And the winner medal in that meet was like winning the medal in the Olympics. Uh, Walter, I have a couple I can show you. <laughs> but when I got to Westside High School, as I said, I was little, and I went out for cross country. It was a fellow named Dan Maltese. And I, I marveled at Dan. I thought Dan was one of the greatest people I've ever met in my life. But there was a guy from Montclair named Walter, n n named Don Philpott. Dan just could not beat Don for some reason. But what I remember most about school stadium were the double headers. One of the greatest football games I ever saw in my life was in 1947. Tom Higgins was on that team. Camisa, I think, was the coach at Central. And I think Thornton was the coach at Westside. I think the score was 18 to 12. Westside won the game in the last five minutes. Mm -hmm. They had a fellow named Slinno, Siraka, Gamma Porter. And Central had a guy named Hooper and Ronnie Owens. The two touchdowns that were scored by Ronnie Owens, they were punt returns. Mm -hmm. And that game drew about 13,000 people. And as I looked the other day to see the new stadium, it just brought back memories. And many of us here in Newark, I always said that athletics was the key to me being successful at anything. Had it not been for athletics, I don't think I'd be here today. I had the pleasure of running for one of the greatest coaches in the world, I think, Dr. Walker, Dr. Leroy Walker, who was about your age, about 93 years old. He was the first African-American Olympic coach in Canada. Then he became the first African-American OIC president in Atlanta. And I had the honor and the pleasure of going down and introducing him into the Winston-Salem Unsung Hills Award. I said, now all these Olympians that you had, Calhoun, Larry Black, Norman Tate, Charles Forster, Uku, Sang, I said, why would you pick me, coach? He said, because she was kind of special. And all of you folks who have, I look over and I see Dr. Kirvin and his lovely wife, Pat, Prince and I, and all of you folks who graduated, summa cum laude, magna cum laude, I really honor you, I really do, because I, I graduated, thank you, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I got a chance to coach uh, I went to Mr. Mr. Uh, who coached boy? Mr. Uh, can't think of his name right now. But Mr. Keel, help me out. Who was the director of his ed? Liddy. Liddy, Joe Liddy. Joe Liddy. When I got out of college, I came and said, Mr. Liddy, I'm a Newarker. I want to coach. I want to give back to the city. He said, well, Lenny, there are no coaching positions open. At that time, it wasn't. And to coach in Newark, you had to know somebody, or you had to be super. But I waited my time, and of course, it wasn't to my liking, but because of the riots, <laughs> because of the riots, I got a chance to coach. And as it was over at Weekwood, I got a call and said, we have an opening over at Weekwood High School. So I went to Weekwood High School, and uh, I spent about 25 years there. And out of those 25 years, we, uh, I, uh, 17 years I coached, and uh, I was fortunate enough to produce 
eight all Americans. Uh, we set uh, the state record in the four by one, which still stands, 41-4 on a sentence. We didn't run the stuff these kids had one. And sometimes you're born before your time. And I uh, remember in the 50s, guys like uh, Rudy Beyond Cohen from West Side, Gomes from the East Side, uh, Chet Smith from West uh, from Barringer, and of course the Barringer and East Orange football game, which was a which was a classic. And they they stopped it because we petitioned to get into the conferences where we weren't getting enough notoriety, and we had to fight tooth and nail to get accepted in these various conferences. So you see the super Essex and whatnot, and a lot of people got mad with us because they said, "Well, why did you destroy the city league?" I said, "We didn't destroy the city league. We just wanted to get." Uh, kudos in the paper, because they were saying that we were inferior. We didn't play the competition. When you put 11 men on the football field, they're the same to me. Sometimes some are better, but they deserve a chance to accomplish things. And you know, and I know, in the 40s and in the 50s and the early 60s, these little schools outside the city of Newark wouldn't dream of playing us in no football or basketball or run track. They knew the deal. So I was fortunate because I went to a school with some great kids. And uh, we won the city, county. We won a county championship three straight years I was on that team. We won two state championships. And uh, the greatest thing I, I, that ever happened to me is winning the city championship. I don't care about the county. I don't care about the state. But to win in Newark and to be the Newark champion, that's something. That's something. And I'm, I'm reminded of it every day. Kids say, hey, coach. And when a kid calls you coach, that means an awful lot. I go to all of the games. In fact, we quit high school. We'll be playing the semifinals on, on Saturday. They're playing Lenhurst. Had it not been for us petitioning to get into these leagues, we'd have never had a city championship in football in recent years. The last one was with, with Frank Ducci in 1975. And he spent his own money to petition the NJSIA to allow our kids to play football. And talking about Frank, that's like, he's a little Lombardi as far as I'm concerned. He had every kid play at every level of football that you could think of. From the Super Bowl, to the Orange Bowl, to the Sugar Bowl. He's had a kid that's in the pro, Andre Tippett. is an all-pro linebacker who played at Barrington High School. And during the 50s, my, my era, there was Don Bradley, there was Cecil Peoples, there was Jim Sessions, there was Moses Hunter, Tom King, Al Adams, Cleo Hill, Davy Cloman, Percy Oliver, the list goes on and on. And in that particular era, every kid wanted to play basketball. Again, I was too short to play basketball. I wasn't heavy enough to play football, so I went out for the track. And somebody said, you should run cross country. And I said, what the, the devil is, what is, what is cross country? They said, up the hill, down the hill. They said, it's two, it's, it's two and a half miles. And I said, you got crazy. I'm not going to do that. I said, two and a half miles, are you nuts? I got to like it. It worked out for me. And the rest is history. We were city, county, and state champs. And to be a part of Newark and watch it disintegrate as it has, but it's on its way back. I may not be around to see it come to fruition, but this is a great city. It's got some great history. Yes. And some great people have come out of the city of Newark. Yes. Okay, if you talk about us, we sure we got our crimes and whatnot, but this is still a great city and I'm very proud to be a part of it. Yes. And coaching at Wicklow High School, well, I don't want to attack my own body, but I was the coach of the year in 1972, most outstanding high school coach in the state of New Jersey. We had eight All-Americans. We went to the pen relays, we were in the championship of America three straight years. I, all of my kids, now my wife is, is sick. She just had an operation. And my phone will not stop ringing. Kids, they put it on Facebook, my daughter's put it on Facebook. And you'd be surprised. You don't know what you do with kids. They come back 20 years from now and say, Coach, you saved my life. If it hadn't been for you, I wouldn't have been anything. I've been to funerals, I've been to weddings, I've been to baby showers. <laughs> You name it. And the kids, every year that they have a reunion, I'm always invited. So that says a lot about the kids and what you do. 
And I believe that uh, education and athletics should complement one another, yes. shouldn't conflict. Mm -hmm. And I've always told my kids, I'm gonna tell you once, but you do it a hundred times. And the kid asked me one day, he said, Lenny, oh, I mean, coach, uh, uh, what do you mean by killing a mosquito with an ax? I said, that means it's your competition. And you're only as good as your last performance. You're only as good as your last performance. Well, coming through the 50s was a little, diff uh, little difficult time. There were places that we couldn't go as, as African Americans. Uh, uh, I remember not being able to go to Olympic Park up in Irvington. Oh yes, oh yes. <laughs> I, I, I remember not being able to go to Rotunda Pool or over here on Clifton Avenue. Uh, I, I bring these things up, folks, because we've made some, some bridge gaps, but there's still a lot that's still in existence. And you have this latent racism underneath. I never thought I'd live to see a, an African-American president, but I have. Uh, and when they talk about great men, every man who's worth anything, any substance about himself, is always a woman. Always a woman. And, and I don't mean walking behind him, I'm talking about walking beside him. And, and, and ladies, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I am so blessed that the woman I'm married to understood that. She used to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, cook chicken and potato salad for, for my athletes. I had, stay with my, I had one kid that I had to take him home with me on Friday, so I know he was Saturday. Uh, another youngster uh, rode away up to Shippensburg, and I told the guy who was at her, uh, of the program up there for underprivileged kids. I said, this kid needs everything. And the, the funny thing is, one of his counselors said, well, you're not gonna amount to anything. Well, this boy's a doctor today. This boy's a doctor. And he came back one summer, his sisters had moved, they had no forwarding address. He called me 2.30 in the morning. He said, coach, I don't have a place to stay. So my wife said, well, what, who is that? I said, it's Willie. She said, Willie, Willie Duke? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, go get him. So we brought him to the house, told the kids to shift over, make room for him. We gave him a key, said, you have a key, when we eat, you eat. You have to save your money, because you don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife made the bold statement, said, listen, whatever you make over the summer, I will match that. He saved $4,000. <laughs> I said, you got a big mouth. <laughs> But those are some, some, some great stories. I've had some sad stories. I've, had, I've, I've been to funerals. Just had a kid named Delano who just died recently. But a testament to how you live is when you die. Yes. You've been to funerals where you see two people, three people. Others, they're overflowing because of what you've done. Now, I'm not a great orator, nor am I a genius or am I bright. But I made it because the efforts of someone else. Yes. No matter what you do in life, there's always somebody who has lifted you up. You didn't do it by yourself. Yes. And regardless of what these folks think about school and education, mm -hmm. teachers, but I'd like to ask, the governor included, did you become a, an attorney by osmosis or did somebody teach you? <laughs> <laughs> you had to have a teacher somewhere. And I've always defended education because I personally feel that education is the ambition and hope of America. And it's better to build boys and girls rather than to men, men and women. So coaching to me is another form of teaching. And I look over at Dr. Bob over here, Dr. Bob Curry, who went to school at, at Princeton. Uh, inner city kid is an example of what you can do when you make up your mind to do it. And don't let anybody, I always told my kids, don't let anybody tell you that you can't be anything. You can be anything that you want to be if you put forth the effort, if you put forth the effort. Now with all the championships and whatnot the way you know it, with all the kids that went to Central, or Barringer, or Weekroy, or Eastside, or Artside, I always thought the Artside, all the geniuses went to Artside. <laughs> <laughs> there was a test that you had to take, but we were the first city to have a school of arts and music mm -hmm. in, in the country. We were the first school to have the uh, full-time recreation. There's some history about North that kids just don't know. They just don't know about it. Everything about Newark is not, not a black eye. 
And I, I won't be around to see it make a complete renaissance. But I'm sure glad I grew up at the time that I did. I tell my grandkids that. They say, what do you mean, Popeye? I said, because my friends, I still know. I didn't have to even sleep with your windows open. Everybody ate at 5 o'clock because there wasn't no what? Burger Kings? <laughs> Chucker, Chucker burgers or whatever you call that stuff. <laughs> what your mother fixed for you, that's what you ate. The Ferrones next door, the Jarrells next door. At five o'clock, the entire block was empty. Why? Everybody was inside eating. Eating. We came out to listen to the Long Ranger, <laughs> listen to the fights. We had radios. I learned to iron when I was eight years old with all the starch. No steam iron. Up on a soda box. And you know what? Never burnt. Never burnt material. Never. My pants set out like a razor blade. <laughs> but those are the things that I, I adore. And I had a younger sister who was recently the superintendent of, of, of the city of Newark. Miss Marion Bolin. That's my baby sister. Younger sister. So when you talk about reaching goals and doing things, I'm very proud of that fact. Very proud of that. Uh, running along to the, to, to the 50s, I think when you talk about hockey days, it's 49, but uh, Scavone and, and, and uh, Tony Peter Paul from West Side and Gone from East Side, uh, Central had uh, Carbone. Uh, there was such a, 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 an arch rivalry in the city. It was great to go out to see the games. And you know you had two, three hundred kids in the band. Mm -hmm. You don't have that. You can go out to the game today and see maybe twenty-five kids. But they want to take away the music. They want to take away the arts. That, that's our culture. Don't don't do that. Don't do that. And all the folks who are making decisions, all the folks making decisions, are not folks who know anything about education, none whatsoever. So again, let me just say that I'm privileged to be here tonight. And. Uh, all of you coming out, and I'll be around for the questions and answers. Good. Okay. They're all up uh, for your input. Uh, let me interject a couple of things and, and maybe call on someone or uh, two for a comment. A uh, guy mentioned, and, uh, and it's to be noted, that all that has been discussed up to this point has been about boys or, or males in sports. And Guy set that up and telling you why, because there was no real interscholastic pro uh, athletic program for girls uh, up until that time, until really 1972, when the federal law was changed and mandated under Title IX that there be equal sports. Uh, but, but, but girls and women participated in other ways. And one of them was in the in, in, through band life, through cheerleading, and so on. And we do have, I don't see him. Jay. You hear uh, Fred? Jay and Fred. Jay and Fred. Oh, me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had asked uh, I, I, Fred, and you heard him mentioned uh, uh, through Paul's talk, and they were uh, schoolmates and teammates uh, at Southside. But, but Fred came back in another role as a teacher and the band director at Southside. And I just want to just give us some brief comments uh, on the ex what the experience was like for uh, uh, boys and girls in band life, cheerleading, and so on. And I see a few women here who were cheerleaders in high school. Raise your hands, your former cheerleaders. There you are. And twirlers and flag wavers and all that good stuff. But give us a little insight, Fred, about band life. Before I talk about that, let me just mention that uh, Paul and I uh, swam together. And Paul mentioned that uh, during the time that we were swimming, there weren't many blacks who participated in swimming. And there were the main reason, well, I guess the main reason was that there wasn't places to practice. You know, it's hard to find somewhere to, to, to practice swimming. But I have always been drawn to the water. Something, I don't even know how to explain it. Something always, always drew me to the water. 
And thank God it, I did swim because now I don't walk very well, but I can still swim. <laughs> <laughs> and that's my exercise. And Paul and I are still friends. Uh, about the band. Yeah, I came back to Southside um, to replace Mr. Gordon, who was uh, a renowned musician uh, and um, was excellent. And Dorothy Snyder was there too. And anyone who knows anything about Newark and music know, will know the names of Dorothy Snyder and, and, uh, and Phil Gordon. Um, I became the band leader, and um, I don't know whether any of you will remember it, but um, during the civil rights time, and, this, and we're getting, we're jumping now. But I had the band uh, <laughs> go down and play uh, freedom songs, uh, walking down in the parades. I know we were we were playing freedom songs, <laughs> and the band played "I Shall Over, We Shall Overcome." Uh, so we made we made the band a part of the movement of what was going on at the time. And of course, the, the young women, uh, twirlers and and, uh, and 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 cheerleaders. Uh, and my old buddy there, uh, Jesse, um, uh, were, were, were part of it. Uh, yeah, and so uh, it made me the person I am today. And again, Paul, thanks for the swimming. Paul and I still talk about swimming. Although, the kind of swimming Paul does is he does laps around Manhattan. Real uh, I, I don't do laps around Manhattan. <laughs> I do laps in the pool. <laughs> Thank you, Fred. There's one more show and tell I want to share with you. Sam, where are you? He's Sam Compton. If you look at the, uh, if you didn't already, you check out the exhibit of photographs we had there. That, but let's go from 1925, the opening of school, see the old school stadium, uh, right up to the early 60s. But one of the pictures uh, uh, that stands out to me is the 1946-47 high school. Uh, uh, basketball team at Central High School. They won the Group 4 State Basketball Championship at the time. The first Newark school to do so. Think of that. The way uh, you fast forward 15 years to the 60s when Newark dominated basketball in almost every group. We didn't win our first state championship until 1946-47. Well, Sam Commerser was a member of that team along with Ronnie Owens and his family members are here tonight, uh, Leroy Smith and others. Sam uh, is a saver, much like uh, I am. Sam still has, and I want you to show us, his, his championship jacket <laughs> from the 1946-47 Central High School basketball. He's coming out of the closet in 64. <laughs> But before we, uh, we do want to open it up, and I'm going to begin with uh, uh, one of the first, it like really goes back to the 30s and early 40s, I guess. Uh, Al Malenkoff. Uh, Al, one of the... What do you want me to do? <laughs> uh, a brief note. You want me to just say something? Say something. You know, I have immaculate generation. I have notes at home. <laughs> I have about 15 notes but everything I memorized. And I don't intend to keep you as long as some of our guests were. <laughs> I grew up in Newark. I love Newark. And the last speaker, God bless him, Newark is, is one of the greatest places to be. I'm, I live in Somerville. And my whole life when I started was in Newark. And when I got to Somerville, everything was closed. No playgrounds. There, the kids had nothing to do. So I opened up the gym at night, let them play basketball, and what have you. I grew up in Newark, and Vinnie Farrell, uh, Bob mentioned it, he was my playground director. God bless him. When Vinnie Farrell had a playground, he said to me, you're going to go to St. Benedict's. I said, what's that? <laughs> and I was at Southside. I played all sports at Southside. My, there were three brothers, and we all played together. 
And I don't know who's in Central here, but the three of us were on the backfield at one time. We beat Central. <laughs> but anyway, that's another story. <laughs> uh, when I, who was I talking about? Vinnie Farrell? Right. <laughs> <laughs> you could run to the president. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, I just want all of you to know, from uh, that playground, I went to Southside, I played three sports for four years at Southside, I then got a scholarship. Vinnie Farrell arranged the scholarship to where? St. Benedict's. <laughs> I didn't know what St. Benedict's was. I'm not going to tell you about the playground, and we had places to swim. I, I'll have to tell you later, I don't have enough time. You have to know your way around Newark to swim. Uh, when I got to St. Benedict's, first thing they said to me, Coach, I was the captain of the football team. They said to me, Joe Kasperger said, you're going to have to learn the Hail Marys. I said, what's that? I'm a Jewish kid. And he said, you have to learn because the captain has to lead the team in the Hail Marys. I led them in the Hail Marys. <laughs> furniture or order uh, uh, a, a fresh vegetable, uh, not to be part of the movies, and I, I didn't take them up on it, but we're still friends, and we still go to St. Benedict's, and I don't have to leave them in the Hail Mary. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Okay, wait, wait, I have one more thing I have. <laughs> I grew up in Southside, and I was captain of the football team, and I'm not too big, but I, I've got stories about price fighting, and I can't tell you this <laughs> some other time. But at, at Southside, uh, when, when we started out in, in, uh, in the school, I'm, you know, I look at you and I forgot what I was going to say. Because <laughs> I know he wants to get me out of here. <laughs> uh, at Southside, I was the captain of the football team, and they said, you're going to have to run for president of the school. I said, I, no, I can't. You have to do it. I said, I, I've never given a speech. We'll get you a speech guy. I said, who will it be? Well, one of my classmates was the mayor of New York, Koch. Ed Koch, he was my speech writer. <laughs> Song. It's easy, no big words. <laughs> Ed gave me that. Now, we, you know who was in my class also? Vivian Blaine. Oh. And I taught her some things, and she became a movie star. <laughs> uh, New York is a great place to grow up. <laughs> All right, now it's your turn. I'm sorry. Who wants to no. contribute? Say. <laughs> you, you <spoke> right. <laughs> well, I forgot to say something. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Who else? Go ahead. I just want to make a, a, a comment that over three decades that you gentlemen spoke about, you, due to time constraints, you only had the opportunity to talk about a handful of, of athletes. If you go to the New York Athletic Hall of Fame website, just type in NewYorkAthleticHallOfFame.org. You'll see since 1988 the hundreds of athletes from the city of Newark who have been inducted into the Newark Athletic Hall of Fame. You can read about them and get some information on the dinners and the upcoming, it's always in October. But you can see the people that we're talking about tonight and many, many, many more. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Yes, sir. Just want to dovetail on that. That is Harry Snyder. He is the president of the Newark Athletic Hall of Fame. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. 
anybody else. I want to refer, refer you to the, the handout that we had. Uh, uh, this is an excerpt from a, a series that, uh, that the Star Ledger ran the sports section years ago when they took a whole state and listed outstanding athletes in all the sports by decade. And what Guy did, uh, great researcher that he is, is pulled the Nurkers that were mentioned in that series. But this is, it was a statewide uh, listing of athletes. So if you're looking for, say, your, your favorite one or whatever, it isn't just your, it's based on what the ledger considered statewide. Yes, sir. In that regard, I noticed as you go over this list, it includes coaches. Mm -hmm. Yes. About a coach <clears throat> who came out of Central High School in the early 60s, who had a phenomenal record during the 70s and was the Star Ledger's coach for basketball during the boys basketball during the 70s, wouldn't be listed here because the three teams that he brought to the state championship were Atlantic City, East Orange, and Montclair. So he wasn't coaching in Newark, even though he was a Newark product. And that would be Bob Lesnar. Yeah. Oh, yes. Again, this, this, right. this survey is statewide. statewide. And right. this is the that I understand. Okay. Um, yeah, I agree. With you. Yes, sir. Just to dovetail in on that, <laughs> so Bob Lester, of course, we didn't get into the 60s, but someone made mention of all the great basketball teams that came out, state championship basketball teams that came out of North, Central, yeah. South Side, and we wait. Uh, perennially. Mm. Westside could beat any of them on a given day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There we go. There we go. Of course, Robert Lester, who I know, I attended uh, Sports Guy Junior College with him, got to know him quite well. Bob Lester was on two of the Central State Championship teams mm -hmm. right. from 62. Two, sixty-three, sixty-three, sixty-four. I'm certain. Yeah. So Starting uh, center at about six, one and a half. Right. But still holds, I believe, the NCAA record while at Montclair State right. for rebounds in a game. Is that right? Forty-five. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Now, pretty soon we're going to have you sing in your high school fight song. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got time for about one or two more comments, and we got to wrap. Well, we need to stay up working overtime, Steve. Yes, what did I see? Bob. Yeah, uh, first of all, I want to uh, congratulate and applaud the, uh, the idea of doing a program of this kind. And uh, listening to these comments, I am so struck by the depth of importance of athletics in the life of the city. Uh, it's um, what I've heard is how deeply intrinsic this is to identity, to the aspirations of the people, to the opportunity for people to really achieve, and how competition really is part of the educational process. And uh, I just want to say this has been a wonderful, wonderful evening to, uh, to, to listen to. Thank you.